This is Ed again in San Diego, and welcome to Global HR News, and Global Business News. And today's special occasion is a news briefing about the Communicator of the Year Awards. And it's all about leadership and whatever that means. Well, we have experts sitting right here and more on the way in who are going to have their own opinion, their own takeaway about what leadership is all about, particularly now in the age of uh, uh, fake media and confusion and disruption uh, coming from all sides of society and the political spectrum and across time and space. So this is going to be a show of common sense and goodwill and good harmony. And the championship uh, winner of that harmony is Stephen Howard. Welcome, Stephen. Whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> glad I, glad I oh, joined you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see smiles. Here we go. So, it's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. So humany and harmony and getting people together who don't really want to be together. <laughs> um, so we're going to have this discussion. It's going to be a little freewheeling. Each of you will be able to give a little mini keynote, and then uh, we're going to open it up for discussion. Welcome, Eve. Thank you. Hello. Now, does everybody know Eve? This is Eve Nasby in San Diego, an entrepreneur par excellence. So Eve, why don't you self-intro a little bit and tell us about your two organizations. Gosh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Eve Nasby. I live in San Diego, California, God's country, I call it. Yes, um, today. I beautiful day today. I've been in the talent industry for uh, over 30 years. If you zoom in, you can count my wrinkles. Um, I own my own staffing agency. We do direct hire placement all over the United States. Um, and I also am the president of a company that's a tech startup in San Diego, uniquely designed for small businesses. Um, you might have heard of a PEO where we are a small business person's PEO, where for only $12 per person per week, we actually become the full employer. So we do all onboarding, offboarding, all the legal stuff, all the HR stuff, everything. And so no one else is doing what we're doing, the way we're doing it. And so, of course, we're experiencing explosive growth which then gives me gray hairs. So between the wrinkles and gray hair, I'm really old, <laughs> but I'm really excited about life because it's good right now. <laughs> well, welcome. And Thank joining you. us from the London area is Heather. Welcome again. Hi, everyone. Did I did I get the, the time zone wrong? Uh, uh, I, no, I feel no, like... no, we just started. Oh, God, you're all <laughs> on time. You're so punctual. Wow, um, that's well, amazing. you know, Americans. You know, so. <laughs> Almost lovely all Americans. See, lovely to yeah, see some new faces. <laughs> lovely to see some new faces and some. Some I'm not going to use the word old because. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but yeah, and you look amazing, Eve. I'm sorry I missed the beginning of what you're talking about, Thank but you. you really don't need to worry about grey hairs. You've got hair, right? We've got to <laughs> make you know lemons out, make lemonade out of lemons. So yeah, as long as you've got right. hair, that's you're you're doing well. <laughs> Okay, Thank so you. Heather, meet Annalisa. A Annalisa. Yes, I've met Annalisa. She's amazing. I absolutely oh, yeah. adore okay. her. I adore her. I'm so glad you're on, Annalisa, because I haven't seen you for a while. Yes, no, no, I haven't been here for a while. It's good to be back. Thanks. For yes. That. Okay, Annalisa Landa uh, and I have known each other a couple of years, and she's been on several shows, although not uh, the past few months. And this is because you've been in self-study and renewal and going down a path. Do you want to explain what I just said? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I've been um, doing something a little bit different and learning how, you know, learning about community management. So that's all about the growth garden that I've got behind me there. So this is trying to create uh, an accessible, affordable, a cross-generational model for personal growth. And um, yeah, so when it comes to leadership, as you know, it's always about values, always banging on about values. And I think more than ever, I mean, it, it, I say this every time, but every time I come on, there seems to be something else that's happened in the world to reinforce that view is that we need leaders to use their influence now 
to amplify the values conversation and to be those channels of healing and compassion <laughs> and reconciliation in the workplace because they are in positions of power and authority and they have a lot of leverage and a lot of influence within their organizations and I think um, yeah it's time for them to step up to the plate and use that influence for good so that's what I'm trying to encourage them to do well good luck yeah exactly <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> so, um, so with us from Dublin is Joseph McGuire, author of Face Facts and Clearview. Clearview Communications is his business. dot com, right? Clearview Communications. dot com. Yep. Clarify that Ed. it's clear sight. Um, clear sight. I'm actually uh, I'm actually currently reading about an organization called Clearview. Um, and I'm a little bit concerned, put it mildly. Um, they've hoovered up pretty much all the, all photos they can access from from the web, no matter from where. And they've they've digitized them. They've they've run them through an AI system, and they're selling them to uh, law enforcement agencies. They're a very secretive organization, and those those photos can be used to detect not just who you are, and even if you're in the background of somebody else's photo. They've got the they've got the ability to detect not just who you are but where you are, and your whole history to where where you are now. So, um, Big Brother is definitely with us. So oh, that's that... clear view, not clear sight. Oh, God, I'm so sorry I mentioned the word. <laughs> 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 well, um, I don't have a mask, and the guy who should have a mask is Chris Exline. He's hiding out from the Russians. <laughs> so you're not. Welcome again. Nope, oh, you're moving. There you are. Just just in case the people from Clearview want to know exactly where <laughs> I am. <laughs> so, this, so everybody, this is Chris Exline, who's live in Ukraine? Kremenets. Kremenets. Yeah, okay. It's Ukraine, yes. Great. Now, and this is near Kiev, right? No, no, no. We're in we're in Western Ukraine. We're about uh, I'd say we're about uh, 500 kilometers, about 350, uh, but yeah, about 350 miles from the uh, uh, about 300 miles from from Kiev, and about 100 some odd miles from the uh, Polish border. So that's a safe place. You know, everybody talks about that, and and yes, it's relatively safe. Um, but when you've had a small town of 20,000 people, we're now over 90 of these young men have died in the in in this war you know the, the families are not safe any family that has lost a son or a husband or a father to this conflict you know you can't say that it's safe is not the word i'd use to describe it i mean i'm not under threat of missiles hitting and, and except for what just joseph described maybe uh if, if things go blank all of a sudden then <laughs> well, we'll know that but you know I, all kidding aside i mean the the, the war is real uh, the impact on a, a small town like this is real. Every single person in this town knows someone who's been afflicted by tragedy. Every single person knows someone uh, who has lost a loved one to this. So and when I hear these reports, mostly when I'm in the United States, about, oh, well, you know, the war seems localized along the river and the front lines. You know, well, why don't you come over and talk to a mother who's just lost her son defending this nation's right to exist? And tell me how how safe she feels at this moment. I'm not trying to you know, bring this down, but I mean, just yeah. I mean, yeah, we're not under threats of imminent attack. And I will say it was kind of cool uh, the other night, uh, two nights ago. Uh, there was an F-16 that, and and Joseph, this is no, uh, it's a coincidence for sure. But an F-16 flew straight over my house, kind of like the you know, like the, the the Super Bowl or something. I mean, it was like the first F-16 flew straight over my house uh, here and flew from. You know, right, right there to there, and uh, it was quite, uh, quite cool. It didn't dip the wings, so it wasn't like it's was saying hi to me or anything. But you know, it's, uh, yeah, I can indulge a little bit. Yeah, yeah, maybe it was, a, yeah, maybe, maybe it was all about me. But uh, <laughs> no, but it was kind of cool to see an F sixteen fly over, over Kremenets and and inspire the the local people somewhat. Not that sixteen F sixteens uh, are, are going to make a material difference to the balance of the war, but you know, every encouragement helps. Okay, Chris Exline uh, moved his headquarters from uh, Hong Kong uh, and uh, sub headquarters in Madrid into Ukraine for the purposes. Uh, now, this is what about two years ago now, right? Twenty-two months. 
Yep. 22 months. And you have been, you, you bought the, the manufacturing capacity of a local uh, company uh, and the, you taught them how to make your mattresses and other home furnishing goods that you've been making uh, in Hong Kong and around the world for years and years. Extremely successful. <laughs> and, would, and yet you fine. come uh, into a war we, we, zone. We've got, we, yeah. we've got Gary here, so I've got to be clear, careful about saying that I'm very successful. But, uh, you know, no, I, it's a because uh, it might hinder my ability to to be a candidate for him someday. The the, the uh, uh, yeah, no, it's been we, we save the jobs in the factory. Um, and yet now our primary focus is through our home essentials furniture rental company. We're the first furniture rental company in Ukraine. Uh, we have two locations, a third one coming up in a month. Um, and we'll have to, I'm opening up 25 stores in this country, even during the conflict. And uh, with the mattress factory, you know, since there isn't really a retail distribution channel for mattresses, um, I have uh, passed the 5,000, now 5,500, but the 5,000 mark where we've donated over 5,000 mattresses to the, the orphans, the internally displaced peoples, a.k.a. refugees and the troops. This show is being recorded as uh -oh. well as streaming live right now and everything you say and do is going to be shown to the world so be careful Good. and no, 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 also, also get your message out when your mm -hmm. time comes so chris Exline, you've been shipping mattresses and hand delivering mattresses to the trenches and yes. that is just amazing and for that effort and that show of strength in your internal strength and the long reach of the U.S., uh, I'm very happy to uh, anoint you to yeah. call attention of your work as a communicator of the year and uh, way to go. Thank and you, Ed. Thank you. if you want to show a slide, if you can do that to augment uh, your words here about what you're doing. Uh, and I know that you'll mask out some of the faces, as I've noticed before, for their safety. And the latest news today uh, that I've read is uh, about the incursion into Russia. And that is pretty amazing stuff. I assume you're not going to go there with mattresses, but what is the a response from the local business community to you. Now, I'm not trying to set you up for applause here, but I, I want to get a grip on the reality of business life in Kyiv, uh, in Ukraine. Um, there's so much money becoming available, apparently, uh, and there seems to be a movement uh, that I've uh, noticed uh, through uh, reports that come my way, that there's peace talks actually going on very quietly and very, very early stage as well. So I don't want you to divulge anything that you know, but the time is coming one way or another for uh, some kind of peace talk and rebuilding. And there's just seemingly a ton of money waiting to explode in Ukraine for redevelopment. And that is why you're optimistic about opening these other factories and stores. Isn't that correct? Um, you know, I know on an interview like this, you should always agree with the presenter. <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, one, I, I, if anybody has any interest, my LinkedIn or Facebook pages have all the information, so I'm not going to bore everyone with death by PowerPoint. But um, one, this 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 country is a failed state. Uh, they don't have enough money. They will never have enough money to rebuild it. Number two, even if if people had a contract backed by the United States State Department to rebuild a hospital, uh, there isn't the liquidity within the system uh, to fund that contract. Number two. You know, or number three, uh, inflation is running at such a high degree that if you have a fixed price contract now, uh, you'll be unable to honor it. Number four, the there aren't enough building materials. Uh, number five, the interest rate is 13% for bank loans. Number six, you don't have enough people. Uh, in order for the Ukrainian economy to grow by 7% a year, they have to find and import 4.5 million workers. 
The population of Ukraine in 2020 was about 44 million. Uh, today, it's at 35 million. Uh, of that 35 million, over 550,000 have been incapacitated by the war. Um, by 2030, that number could go all the way down to 25 million. So there's and, and there is no coordinated effort within the government for reconstruction. So, you know, Ed, you know this, but I I, I was involved. I furnished the green zone basically in Baghdad. Um, I did. Pre I was a designer in President Karzai's palace in Kabul and furnished most of the embassies in Af in Kabul, Afghanistan. I I you know actually set up the government of, of South Sudan and Juba and Al Fasha and Madagascar, Libya, Djibouti, and places like that. So we are a qualified contractor with regards to access and information on those things. There is no coordinated effort here. And nobody actually knows how to get it done or how to prioritize it. Um, and, you know, so there, and there's not a lot of money. Right now, the government of Ukraine uh, spends about $8 billion a month on things like pensions and salaries and just running the country. But yet their tax intake is only about $3 billion. That delta, that uh, five billion dollars a month, is being funded through donor nations, uh, you know, the IMF and the World Bank and things like that. So, when you talk about peace discussions, um, there's an unsustainability by by both sides. You know, Russia, uh, if it wasn't being uh, backstopped by China, wouldn't be able to have it on on a war footing. Uh, but Russia is desperately looking for an off ramp um, and a victory. Uh, Ukraine is in a horrible position of being unable to prosecute the war, you know, despite an incursion here and there. And so, you know, I don't know if you'll, you'll hear about it more. It's called option three. But, you know, what, what's basically nothing's going to happen until we know who the next U.S. president is. And that that will then be the deciding factor. And, um, you know, once that occurs, then I think, you know, don't hold me to this, even though it's being recorded, the lines you kind of see. You know, at, at, at the first week of November, are probably going to be the lines that uh, uh, that that will be more of a ceasefire than than a peace settlement. And with that, then what's left of Ukraine will have to be immediately grafted into the European Union uh, to save it. I mean, uh, Ukraine is vitally important, not just for natural resources that have yet to be untapped, uh, but for you know agriculture and uh, a cheap you know the the labor wages here are significantly lower than what they are in the European Union. So what about Odessa? It's re very next door to the current occupation zone and uh, pretty close to a war zone itself. But they seemingly are keeping hands off that. Seemingly. Well, there, no, because Odessa is the most important part of Ukraine at this moment, more important than Kiev. It's the shipping. Because, yeah. because of the, the, yeah, right now, the, the only real form other than Donor contributions of direct foreign currency is the exportation of wheat and other uh, agricultural products, and that only occurs through the ports of Odessa. So investment will be heavy in Odessa, like grain elevators, ports, and things like that, because then, you know, for business people, they can see, okay, if we spend X million on this grain elevator or storage facility or port or enlargement, then we'll be able to make X amount and in, in increase shipping taxes and things like that. Um, and so that you know, so Odessa is 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 really uh, the most important city because that's that's the one clear place where you can see a direct line between investment and a return on investment. So very close by to that city down there, the historic city of Odessa, um, is Moldova, Moldova and Bulgaria is, you know, Bucharest is pretty close there. And of course, everything's pretty close there in Germany, Poland. There well, must you know, be this huge, huge um, uh, Iron Dome kind of things being set up, if not already. Well, I, I think the Iron Dome is a, a discussion for a, a different panel. Um, you know, not not this one. Uh, Moldova, sadly, is a landlocked nation without access. Uh, you know, Bulgaria does have a, a nice coastline on the Black Sea. And let's not forget Moldova. Uh, which is Russian speaking, has 10,000 Russian peacekeeping troops uh, there. Um, and so I, you know, the, these talks about Moldova's ascension into the European Union is, is trickier than Ukraine's. Um, and Moldova has done nothing uh, to expel those 10,000 Russian troops. Um, so the spy networks, the, I'm sorry, uh, sorry, Joseph, it's called information gathering uh, <laughs> that, that occurs there. You know is is rather extensive 
it does share a very long border, uh, you know, with Ukraine as well. So M- Moldova is a tricky thing. I don't, I don't, and, and Moldova from a GDP perspective is, is not even a rounding error. Um, you know, it's smaller than Luxembourg, not, not area wise, but GDP wise. So, so I think that, uh, you know, they're, they're just doing that, but until they get rid of, I mean, these 10,000 troops in Moldova would be similar to Kalingrad, which is, which is next to, to, to Poland on the, uh, you know, it's a, right in the middle of Europe. So, you know, it's, it's how you carve that out is, is very complicated. Thank you, Chris, for doing this deep dive and thanks for your time here. Um, and pretty close to supper time for you or happy hour. Uh, well, you know, this is some of the best uh, Ukrainian <laughs> water uh, I can find. And, uh, you know, so it's uh, it's fantastic. It's a little bit stronger than some of the water I, I knew when I was in the United States or in Hong Kong. But, uh, you know, if I get to uh, thanks for having me on early because I could get quite animated by the uh, by the end of this interview. <laughs> OK, everybody, this is Tatiana St. Germain, and she's coming to us from Orlando. And the work that you're doing about talent assessments and helping smaller businesses um, assess the right talent before they wind up losing money on hiring the wrong person, please take it from here, Tatiana. Thank you for having me, Ed. It's nice to see everyone. Hello. Um, Yeah, when we talk about talent, what I find is Today, organizations need to strive to not only find the right talent, go after the right talent, lure the right talent. They need to create a culture where they can attract the right talent. Um, that it, The right people will find you if you have an appealing uh, culture. And that includes having the right leaders in the right places and having the right team members in the right places as well. Because that's when you have an organization where every employee is fully engaged in winning. And don't you want to be on the winning team? And when you have employees who or new candidates applying, going through the interview process and then through the onboarding process, they realize, you know what, all of these people that I'm meeting this week are not going to be here next week. How does that make that individual feel? Does it make them feel like they want to give their best? to the organization and to the clients they're serving? Probably not. So you all could relate throughout your career some time ago or right now, if you're lucky, you've worked with amazing individuals. Imagine all of us got together and we built a company. We could probably rule the world Um, because we like each other. We know what we contribute. We're passionate, we're enthusiastic. We're we're the best at what we do. Um, So, If you could capture that in your organization, take your top people, get a psychometric assessment tool like the ones we provide and measure what makes them unique, what makes them tick, and then create that unicorn profile, a purple squirrel, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, It's your A players. And then only hire A players. What will it do to your organization? And that's what we do for companies. Dr. Ken Lloyd, welcome again. Um, Talk to us about performance appraisals following up on what Tatiana was just mentioning. Absolutely. Tatiana, that sounds absolutely fantastic. And I do want to do a quick congratulations to Steve on his honor that was just bestowed upon him. Uh, Excellent work, Stephen. Uh, Your newest book is just a wonderful book on partnering for those who want to do business in the U.S. It's just just a remarkable piece of scholarship as well as very practical information. Uh, In in terms of performance appraisal, it ties into a lot of what uh, is already being talked about and I'm sure will be touched on further as we we continue our discussion today. But people hear the phrase performance appraisal and you immediately get that kind of queasy feeling in your stomach. Oh my gosh, I got to go through that again and it's once a year, and if I'm a manager, what I say to these people, if I'm an employee, I kind of cringe. Fortunately, it has changed, and uh, we see some real major improvements in the process. Certainly, a big picture, it is far more focused on two-way communication, on a dialogue between employees and their managers, 
ongoing, so it's not a once a year process. Even the formal evaluations are done more frequently, whether it's twice a year or even quarterly. Something called continuous feedback in which managers and their employees are meeting regularly to talk, to catch up, and certainly for managers to provide coaching, guidance and support, and for employees to ask questions, any questions that they want. And it gets into, certainly gets into the kind of culture that you're talking about, Tatiana, of one of respect and trust and openness and transparency and diversity and authenticity. These kinds of factors, very different from an appraisal. You know, just go, hey, you did this well, you did this poorly. And by the way, three months ago, you did a nice job on that. But then four months ago, I did that's all useless information. It just totally does nothing more than, than upset the employees, as opposed to a process now that is designed to help energize, motivate, and help develop the employees. Certainly, uh, you know, as Paul, Fal <coughs> excuse me, as Paul Falcone and I have talked about, you know, with Gen Z and millennials, they're far more interested in career development, where, where is this all going? And here, companies and managers individually have a real opportunity to help lead these individuals, guide them, support them, and from the standpoint of recruiting, help recruit them by creating a climate and culture that is not traditional performance appraisal, rather focused on feedback, feed forward, growth, development, honesty, integrity, to integrity, the kinds of factors that would be in the kind of organization having met all of you virtually and some in person that we'd all wanna be part of in, in one way or another. So performance appraisal is now fitting far more into that. And I know the word appraisal has nothing to do in terms of its roots from the word, because the word praise is almost embedded in it. But from the managerial standpoint, it's kind of nice to think about, you know, getting opportunities to praise your employees, catch them doing something right, reinforce that, and certainly attaching your reinforcement close to the behavior uh, that really was displayed, whether it's positive or whether it's constructive feedback and not delaying it at all. If we really want learning to occur, it doesn't occur if we wait any significant amount of time between a given behavior, positive or negative, and then providing feedback on it. And this doesn't mean there can't be discipline and we have to keep everyone who's failing. If they're really struggling, you can certainly identify it, work with them. And if a performance improvement plan is needed, it's put in place. And if it's not, this is not the right match for the employee, you're doing that employee a favor as well as the organization a favor by moving beyond. And uh, that's also part of it. So it's not just simply hand-holding and you're so great, you're so wonderful. It's really a balanced, honest approach to help people develop and help the organization develop. So that's pretty much the, the big picture. And uh, we'll, we'll right. go from Thank there. You. And I, I look forward to the in, added comments from the rest of our, I will call this our team today. Yes, a mastermind team. So I want to bring in, uh, and I want to expand on what you were just talking about by bringing in Paul and Eve and Steven and everybody, of course. Um, Let's talk about first uh, back to you, Ken. Uh, about uh, what do you deal and how do you deal with problem people, uh, including antisocial Gen Zers? Uh, that's it's an interesting question. There's no one automatic formula for dealing with people, as you would call people problems or problem people. From the managerial standpoint, the idea would be, I need to find out exactly. What is behind this? I'm looking at behavior. What's generating this dissatisfaction or these questionable or subpar performance uh, issues that we're starting to see and try to identify that. You want to hear it from the individual to learn from that person and then put together a program to help that individual succeed. We don't have to put up with it. But look, there are times when performance can be so problematic that it's intolerable on the spot. There are egregious behaviors at work that cannot be tolerated. I mean, if you take an extreme, whether it's, it's sexual harassment or bullying or drugs at work or weapons at work. I mean, it just doesn't mean we, we always roll over for these problem employees. But depending on what the problematic behavior is, we as managers and as leaders want to try to understand our employees as individuals, work with them and build to the extent that we can 
and uh, go in with positive expectations that this can be improved. And because those we know expectations impact outcomes and take our, our very best shot in working with the individual and give them the, the best opportunity. I've seen many cases over my consulting and managerial career in which employees that seemingly were problem employees, but we got them into the right situation, learned about what was going on and help them grow and develop and thrive into very productive individuals. I mean, there's some organizations where people say, this employee, you know, he's out there, he's influencing the group to do this and that and the other. What are we gonna do with him? He's a bad, well, that person may be showing leadership behaviors. The group coalesces around this individual, they listen to this individual, they respect this individual. Maybe there's something we can do there, again, whether it's here or somewhere else, but people can be helped. And I think that's part of the process. It doesn't mean that everyone can all the time. Uh, we do have to do what's best for them and the company. And sometimes it calls for, for firm and, and quicker decisions, uh, but that's part of the process. Thank you, Dr. Ken Lloyd, communicator. <laughs> let's, go, <laughs> let's, let's, let's go quickly uh, further and deeper. Paul Falcone, welcome. Uh, thank you, Ed. I do whatever Ken says, so <laughs> I, 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 I'm fine. I sit in the front row in his class and I take notes. It's, it's very easy. And I say the same thing to Paul, by the way. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, Ken, you're spot on. I think the reality is, especially when you look at the, enter, the younger generations, the Gen Y millennials, the 45 and under crowd, the Gen Z Zoomers, the 25 and under crowd, they want career and professional development. This comes out of all the surveys that are done. It's top three, top five in every survey I've seen. To Ken's point, doing a once a year annual performance review is a paper chase. There's no value to it. The value lies in giving real-time feedback so they can master their craft and learn their career and you know master their trade, whatever you want to call it. It comes in the form of recognition, right? Don't be afraid to say, well, I can't recognize my employees. It'll go straight to their head. They're going to want more money. That's baloney. We tell ourselves those narratives, but those narratives don't make sense. Every generation gets a chance to reinvent itself. And the Gen Y and the Gen Z are reinventing the workplace. And employers are going to be really smart to look at what their priorities are and try and build things around that, programs around it. The third part of it, part of it Ken, to your point, is on accountability. It's like, look, if there's a problem, we need to address it in real time. We need to reset expectations and move forward. Um, but we have to know how to protect ourselves and protect the company too, because we live in a litigious society. So when you look at those things for me in my writing ad, I've always tried to focus on the how, right? They kind of know what to do, but they're afraid to open the can of worms. They don't want to say the wrong thing. So they sweep it under the rug. They look the other way. They hope it fixes itself. And then, you know, 30 days later, boom, some proverbial straw is broken on the camel's back. And then they come running into my office and human resources and want the person fired. This is all drama. It's all reactive. So for me, it's giving them the language. And in a lot of my books, I talk about here are the scripts. Here's the way to open those conversations. Here's how to frame it in terms of their own career and professional development for things that may be missing awareness. And you'll find that when people are hearing things where they feel like this is for my own good to get better, they're going to want to assume responsibility for it and fix it right then and there because you're making it safe for them and you have their back to do it while in your shop. So you really can turn around people with quote unquote attitude problems, although that's not a term I recommend. The point is we do our best that we can to pay it forward and to build as many leaders as we can. The ones, Ken, to your point, whether it's here or elsewhere, sometimes it's just not right for them. They're just not in the right position at this point in their lives. Yeah, you do have to move them out. You have to know how to do that safely. But again, it's all part and parcel of giving that feedback, making the right record, being there for them to give them a chance to turn it around. But if they can't, then holding them accountable and moving them out. Eve Nasby, uh, you have direct one-on-one uh, -on -one with business owners, small business owners for the most part. Isn't that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And before we go there, I'd like to go here. This is 101 Tough Conversations by the one and only Paul Falcone. <laughs> These are scripted. They're all in here. This is one of the best books you'll ever buy. If you have a challenge with an employee, you simply go to that page, which I've bookmarked a few, and uh, here's your scripts. It's all right here. Who needs AI when you got Paul Falcone to have tough conversations? So That's a good quote. I like that. There's a bumper sticker in Way there. Way to go. I like it. It's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. 
And with Paul yeah. Falcone, with Paul, Paul Falcone, you get real intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Oh, I'll oh, keep it going. My marketing team, I love it. <laughs> no extra charge for that tagline, let me tell you. That's fantastic. Okay, does anybody uh, yeah. want to wave a banner? We're on live TV. <laughs> I'm starting to blush. I would say no more, please. I'm good. I'm good. Like, no, no, really. No, no, really. It's okay. <laughs> okay. So, yes, so, I... so do you interview before you take the client on? I would assume yes, that's a yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. Uh, so yes. what happens when you have somebody who's, you know, you just get a funny feeling about that's made nothing to do about will it work will i get paid but just the kind of person that you know ugh, you know i don't want to, i don't want to deal with this person do, do you farm it out or do you just close the door on that person that is, so if you're talking about interviewing the the client yeah. company for a solid healthy culture absolutely because we care almost more we do we care more about our candidates that we send in than we do about the company um because we want that candidate to have a next professional um, chapter in their life. And we want that to be exemplary because our name is all over it. Um, so yes, absolutely. And I think what I would piggyback on top of what Paul and Ken have both said is that when we're talking to small companies and on the band of hands, so that's on my recruiting side, on the band of hands side, the, the biggest mistake I think we are seeing right now, because people are now giving us all of their HR problems because that's what they're paying us to do. And what we're hearing is there's issues that are coming to us that it should have been addressed a long time ago. And I think leaders are reticent because they're so busy and myopic on putting out the fires that are on their desk that they're ignoring the challenges and the toxicity that's in the organization from a personnel standpoint. So my encouragement would be for those small business owners or medium business owners is, is be very quick to fire, slow to hire. You've got to be quick to jump on these issues as they're occurring within the organization so that the culture doesn't start to crumble because one person can make a difference for good or bad. Oh, okay. Let's digest that as we go to Annalisa. You're on mute. I am. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Lots of Welcome. Yeah. Lots of thanks, Ed. Lots of interesting things to pick up on. I'd love the, the conversation here about values. Um, Ken and Tatiana both mentioning those. Talk louder, and please. Absolutely. Yeah, actually, I will um, just check on my volume setting. I won't be a sec. Uh, I, I can hear you well. If ah, it's any there you go. Yeah. Thank you. Is that better for yes. everybody? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Excellent. We, we, we just want to hear your accent also. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for feeding back. No, I love the conversations about values um, and culture. What Eva's just said as well about one person, yeah, really changing the climate and the culture in a team or an organization and how you deal with that person. Um, because you can have such smart people doing excellent jobs and yet bringing the whole energy of the team down which therefore affects the productivity and the um, the motivation of um, of you know the whole group of people, and that can greater affect the productivity negatively in an organisation or in a department. So I think swift dealing with these you know with with these people, as Paul has also said, is really is really important. Um, I like to facilitate dialogue uh, in organizations and get people around the table um, talking about things that maybe they wouldn't necessarily get to talk about in the course of an ordinary working day when everybody's just focused on getting the job done that they're there to do. Um, and so that people actually seem, feel seen and feel visible and feel invited to talk and contribute to the conversation. Whereas sometimes in an organization, they uh, they may not, uh, they may not feel as though it's their place. They might, might not be encouraged to speak up. And uh, very often um, in business, I think um, the introvert uh, can get passed over and looked over when they've got so much to offer if only they felt as though they were in a safer place um, to engage. 
So that's what I try to do in in organisations as well as inspire and facilitate the values conversation as in we all bring different values to the workplace. We're never going to share exactly the same values, but how do we work together to align our values such that that we, we can respect and hear and understand everybody's point of view and where they're coming from so that we can get on together and encouraging conversations, as I say, facilitating them so that people get to know one another at a level that they might not necessarily in the time that they're with a business or an organization or within the time span that they need to do a great job and and flourish within that organization so so yeah uh, making people feel valued heard seen and listened to I think is really important that's what I try to do you are a communicator and um, that's why I'm I want you on this program, of course, is to bring recognition to you as you are, I happen to know that you are going through um, personal changes and redirection right now, and I wish you well. And I wanted to ask you about the design that's over your shoulder there. It shows uh, almost a cartoon type description. Um, Are you uh, appealing to or targeting demographically are you targeting young people I am yes but I really want this to be a cross-generational exercise of talking about dialogue and I'm talking about understanding and 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 people uh getting together and bridging those gaps between the generations so I would like to attract young people to it as well um and I suppose uh yeah maybe quirky creatives like me um but it's for anybody who wants to go deeper, I think, and to keep on that growth journey, um, it's um, a culture. I mean, you can see the strap line. We, we sow, we give, we grow. And that really embraces the philosophy of the growth garden. Um, we are uh, gardeners of people. We're landscapers of visions. But we're also reaching back and helping up the person who is beside us. And if a door of opportunity opens for us, we're taking somebody through that door of opportunity with us. And that's why I've got that image behind us of people uh, behind me, of people helping each other up the steps um, to, you know, to go higher. And um, also hope uh, is a very important value for me, one that I want to keep encouraging in this kind of climate that we're living in at the moment. Um, so um, we've got this little hedgehog here called uh, Hope the Hedgehog, and he appears <laughs> just about <laughs> everywhere in the growth garden, but sometimes he'll be lurking mischievously, uh, maybe hiding behind something, but it's a metaphor. It's a reminder that even when we don't necessarily see it or feel it, Hope is always closer than we think. So So let me uh, interject here for the audience, uh, not only in the what I call the global meeting room right here with us, but the audience out there in the world who will watch this in subsequent days, weeks and months beyond today. Your theatrical background is like a perfect, in my opinion, it's a perfect match for what you're what what you're restructuring into and especially gearing a younger uh, target a demographic because you could communicate so easily using your theatrical talents but that audience will eat it up i am very much hoping so i do hope that they're going to resonate with this and uh and and take on board everything that i've got to to, to offer i'm hoping that um being more youthful than I actually am in years, <laughs> being more <laughs> youthful will, um, yes, engage them and I'll be able to build a rapport with them so that I can take them on this journey and help them to really grow into their leadership boots um, and and emerge as leaders, no matter what they uh, they plan to do with their lives, that they see that they are all leaders in some capacity and that they can all be a leader in their life and not wait for people to give them permission to do so, uh, that they 
are in positions of influence and always will be and they need to be aware of that so that's what I want to you know as I say take them on this growth journey so that they become more self-aware um yeah your communicator let's go to Stephen Howard um this sounds like there's an autobiography building here with Sounds like a successful autobiography, which is indication of a successful life. So well done, Annalisa. Um, can I bring it? I want to bring you, it. Stephen. Bring it back to the conversation about problem employees and and kind of raise hopefully some new thinking for everyone on this. Is that my experience anyway? Both in the professional when I worked for companies and as a coach and mentor, problem employees don't appear overnight. They build up over time. And the reason they become problem employees is that their managers, their leaders, let things go. I think somebody said, talked earlier about sweeping things down the carpet. You know, leaders have to, one of our responsibilities as leaders, we have to nip things in the bud. And if somebody's, you know, doing something that's incorrect or behavioral problems, um, we need to nip it in the bud and, and mentor them and coach them. So, Part of the problem with problem employees is their managers, is their leaders who are not doing a sufficient job. And, you know, you talk about bringing people into, into an organization. That's one of the reasons for the either 90 days or six months, whatever it might be, probationary periods. That's when you a leader has to really identify these things and decide whether or not that person's going to work in the organization. Um, interestingly, and I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, I'm now partnering with a talent acquisition company. Uh, and what they're doing is they're employing me as a coach. When they put somebody into an organization, they're paying me to coach that person for three to four months. So they have a, a person to talk to outside the company about the problems that they're having, onboarding, the difficulties they might have in adjusting to the culture, the unexpected problems they might be having with peers or colleagues or uh, senior management that they you know, can't identify during the hire and recruitment process. And I think that's going to work very well. And so basically the talent acquisition company is taking out of their own fee and putting me there to make sure that the, the person is successful. And I think that's it's going to be interesting to see how that develops over the next few months. Communicator Stephen Howard. Gary Sanger, there's a lot of good talent here for you. I'm trying to think tactfully how I could respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's not. <laughs> there's not. Gary has high standards. <laughs> you know, it's a situation where, Stephen, your boss comment about the bad employee or we talk about the executive, I mean, oftentimes, oftentimes we're way too nice and we're way too blurry on what it is we're in business to do. Why is this company in business? I'm struggling with this with a client that uh, we're really in essence trying to figure out what business we're in. And we then have a few executives off in different directions. I was on a panel here several months ago, and it was a whole bunch of really nice people talking about the typical issues that a company has. And I just couldn't help myself. I said, you know, it's that conversation you have right after you leave this, this group, and you go in and invite your worst employee on your team into your office, and you ask them to have a seat. And you start the conversation by saying, you suck. <laughs> now, everybody got really offended by that. Everybody said, well, look, you know, the attorneys are going to have a field day and they're all going to make a lot of money. Well, you do things properly with your HR team, et cetera. But have we not all been on a team or all been in a business where you've got a small handful of folks that are terrible? And they've been allowed to get away with it. And they've been allowed to skate past because they must have had pictures of someone or they must have had some allegiance to some second cousin that was in authority. I, I'm, I'm really being very fourth grade simple on this. What is the business you're in? We talk about performance reviews. Should they not be focused on the important stuff that the company's trying to do? 
are we not all there trying to serve that customer? And that customer, if he's not being served by you, another competitor is going to go take that business with those products or services. So bringing it back, you suck, of course. That's not very professional. I am originally a farm boy from Idaho, so I'm used to speaking much worse than that. But I think the clarity, most of those people that aren't performing well aren't having fun either. They're not enjoying themselves there. They might just be collecting a paycheck. And so in my opinion, if you're really clear about what are those few things that from the board, from the CEO, you're going to appraise, you're going to reward, you're going to develop, you're going to keep them. I think you also, as that person's in your office and he's heard those or she's heard those two words, you also get up and demonstrate that that door's not locked. You don't have to be here. So in the participation, sure, buildings on fire, dictatorship, tell people what to do. Now I can see people squirming on this call when I'm being so blunt. And frankly, that's okay. But you also then go get those best few employees and tell them how unbelievable they are. How unbelievable they are. And you make sure they're paid accordingly. Then me, the retained headhunter, swooping in for that great employee, they're not gonna talk to me or they're gonna refer me to somebody else. Those are, that's the elephant in the room, I think, oftentimes that we're dealing with, with our clients. And Eve, as you take on a client and this client uh, you know, isn't going to be coachable, isn't gonna be part of the team, you probably say, no, thank you. Now, if I created that pregnant silence here where people look around and say, shut his, you are a communicator, Gary Sanger. So I want to go to the business psychologist, Heather. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for putting me now straight after Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think what I'm hearing from everyone um, is the need for the building of psychological safety, because what I'm hearing from everybody is that People need to be able to express how they feel, whether a team's functioning, whether a team's not functioning, whether the business is working, whether it's not. And for instance, yes, what Gary said, it's, it's blunt, but I can it resonates with me in certain aspects of the clients I work with. Um, there's nothing worse than having a false positive or a false negative as an outcome of a hire, right? And the experience I have with my clients is that so a false positive means that a company has hired someone and they've made a big mistake. Or a false negative is all of those candidates that could have been right for the role and they haven't been hired, but there's actually no way of checking for that because you've let those candidates go. So psychometrics is also part of being a business psychologist as well. It's one part of a, of a very good uh, recruitment campaign and talent management and everything else, especially if the KPIs continue forward. But I think that we have a certain amount of psychological safety and all that means is, is that nobody is at risk. They can express themselves in a, an environment that is safe for that person to express themselves. And I really believe the emphasis is really on psychological safety and team building. Now, this is what I'm seeing in all the work that I do. And I think, Ed, you do a great job of facilitating psychological safety. You may not realize that's what you're doing, but actually that is what you're doing. And I'm seeing a few people nod around me. So psychological safety is just basically a, a, an open space. Forget the word psycho, psych, psych, psychological. Basically what it means is, is that people can bring their selves into a discussion. And as Annalisa said, if you've got an introvert who generally is not expressing themselves because of the, psych the, 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 the personality traits that they have, then a good leader uh, uh, will facilitate a process where that person is able to express their ideas and innovation can evolve from that. Um, and psychological safety also means, exactly as Gary says, that if you need to have that one-to-one -one where it's a little bit more direct and you give 
uh, concrete examples of where that person is not performing, but then mitigating steps for them to improve their performance, then that's actually how we should all be managing our own performance, exactly as Ken says, on an ongoing basis so that we are able to react immediately and improve immediately, which makes us happier and makes the business more productive. So psychological safety, that's what I say. The Harvard Business Review has got some excellent articles on psychological safety, what it is. I'm happy to share links with people if they want to read more about it. But it's nothing more than that, making people as effective and as efficient as they can be in a space that is free for them to express themselves, including managers as well. Bravo. That's a communicator. And Heather is going to be a featured speaker in my London event in person inside the uh, Global Trade Bank, uh, HSBC, which is once again going to host and facilitate my London meeting on October 1. Chris Exline was at uh, the first one we did uh, a couple of years ago with HSBC, and hopefully you'll come back if you're in Europe again, in Western Europe. Uh, I welcome am you. I in, am I invited? You are invited, but please sponsor. <laughs> i'm a communicator what can i say <laughs> well you know i i i i i walked into that one uh well Ed, yeah, no, so no, I, uh, I just talked to no much. no at at, at at the the first meeting you had at canary wharf was uh for those of us that have known ed for 20 25 years <laughs> nothing it was, <laughs> it was fantastic it was fantastic to see to see the uh uh it was fantastic to see the uh the, the return of the Ed Cohen conferences. So, um, you know, send me the sponsorship levels and uh, <laughs> uh, I will, uh, I, I will, I will make sure that uh, uh, we would gladly sponsor. And if I can be there on October 1st, uh, then I would love to, to participate. Okay. Now I can rent that apartment. Thank you very much. And I want to <laughs> no, go no, back. No, 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 no. You, you can't rent that apartment at, at London. <laughs> London property rentals are off the charts. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll 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 get you a closet somewhere, but uh, jo we'll, we'll we'll make sure that Joanna has a nice hotel suite. Uh, you you can you can, I can sleep visit, on the train. right? Yeah. Visit. yeah. yeah. yeah and well, I want to go back to Heather's point. I think it's really spot on. The oh, do you have to be serious? Wow. Well, we do for a second. <laughs> I, I my interpretation it could be. It shows an environment where you can have an opinion different than your boss, and it's safe to do that. It could be where you have another opinion, another direction, another opportunity for an organization different than your boss, and it's safe to do that, you know, rather than just being that negative voice out there. So I think that that term you described, Heather, is uh, is spot on. Wow. Listen, the uh, communicator... Uh award also goes to uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Mark Colo, who's been sitting very quiet. He's not very quiet, but he, he's, I've been keeping him quiet till now. <laughs> so Mark uh, is a communicator uh, par excellence uh, in a way that's different than everybody else so far. Um, He's been in the mobility of business as an executive, a household goods transportation executive, the specialist in taking care of multi-million dollar valued uh, medical stuff and guaranteed safety of delivery uh, with world-class brain surgeons and research scientists trusting Marcolo to take care of their specimens. And he did. He has been afflicted with Parkinson's for a number of years. He's, as you may know, Parkinson's makes you uh, shake a little bit. I'm going to let him talk in just a second. And yet he gets up in front of Ted, a Ted audience <laughs> speaker. <laughs> and get this, he did a great job. Let's welcome Mark Colo here. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. I was starting to worry maybe you forgot about me back here in this little corner here. No, no. I, I see you and your family there. It's like the mafia looking at me. <laughs> By the way, this is my brother, Paul. He's a year older than I am. 
And can anyone guess what he has in, in his hands there? Can anyone take take a guess? It looks like an Easter egg. An egg. Very, very an egg. close. What? <laughs> Any other guesses? An Ostrich egg. egg. It's a, a very large egg. It actually belongs to a bird that's now extinct. Dodo. You got who said that? Me. You got it. I'll send you something. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. But that probably would make the largest omelet on the planet, I'm sure, if we put it in a frying pan. I don't know if there's even a frying pan big enough for that egg. But anyway, <laughs> Paul's, Paul uh, currently works at the San Diego Zoo down near you, Ed. So yep. if you want to meet him in person, he's just a fascinating guy. Yes. I've, I've loved the conversation so far because I can recognize a little piece of each of the companies I've worked for in the moving industry, which have been many, and I can see what Ken to your to your uh, words, I could I could tell by some of the comments that we were making a lot of mistakes at those companies. And Ken, had you known about half of my companies I worked for in my career, I think you could have come in there and made a difference. So I appreciate what you do, and I really respect that. Uh, I've had Parkinson's for 18 years. Uh, they say it's a gift that keeps on taking. And it's kind of what it does. So it, it is a challenge. But my TEDx talk was kind of a, a coming out party for me just to come out and say, this is what I'm doing now. This is what, what Parkinson's has meant to me and kind of gave me a different perspective, so to speak. So the name of the talk, if you, when you, if you do choose to watch it, and all you need to do, if you go on chat, you can see you just put three words in your Google search box. Those three words are Mark, M-A-R-K, Colo, C-O-L-O, and Talk, T-A-L-K. You hit enter, and it'll take you right into my talk. I gave it in, at Tuacon, which is a performing arts facility here in St. George, where I now live. And we had 500 people in attendance. It sold out. Two weeks before the show, I was the opening speaker, and I was scared to death. I mean, it was I, I, not knowing how my Parkinson's symptoms were going to react and not wanting to distract at all. You got all these thoughts going on in your mind. It's not easy to manage, but I got through it, and I had a standing ovation in the beginning and at the end, and that made me feel very, very good inside, so... One so, thing I want to mention about to the point that somebody said about um, the managers failed. Gary, was that you? You talked about how managers can used to be the, the cause of failure in businesses. I found at one of my companies that it was it was ego, and it was somebody that was high enough on the ladder and had a big enough ego that they used to call the sales team, which are the ones who bring me in all the revenue, the clan, C L A N. So that's how he, the owner, felt about his sales team. And it was basically building his retirement home in Maui. I mean, just amazing. And all he had to do was show some empathy, listen to the team, get some ideas, weigh other ideas, and take other options. So I'll say one last thing about this, then I'll move on. But the, the last thing that this one gentleman who was getting all the praise, all the praise, all the attention, all the rewards, his brother said, you know, I'm going to mark my words. He worked at the company. This company is going to shrink to the IQ of two people, the owner and his right-hand man. And that was literally all roads led, led to Rome. It was very oppressive to work there. Had my most lucrative career ever working there. Loved everything else about the company, but just didn't feel good about the lack of communication. And uh, I can be blunt, as you can see. I can, I can get pretty blunt about these situations. But it was painful to see how it was impacting a lot of the rank and file employees that wanted to speak up, but they were afraid they'd lose their job if they said something negative. And that's a bad, bad place to be. So that's where I think, Ken, you could be the knight in shining armor that comes in. You know, you get your sword out and he says, this is how it's going to be, guys. So sometimes diplomacy might need to go out the window, but you certainly need to weigh that in, in, in all cases. Mark, um, you're, in, a, Mark, 
Mark, you're an inspiration, and I thank you for for giving us this talk here. Um, I want to announce that Mark uh, uh, partnered with me in a series, a medical TV talk show series. We started, what, about three years ago, maybe That's more? Right. And we've had several uh, prominent uh, world-class research scientists as guests, not from me, <laughs> I just hosted, uh, but Mark brought them on. And they, uh, we didn't have a script, but we had talking points just like you and I have, you know, about tips and keywords. Uh, and the gist of those were to go public with some medical research stuff having to do with brain and neuro diseases, neuro, neuro afflictions. Uh, and uh, so we're doing it again on September 5, and with us will be uh, a world-class research scientist, Dr. Howard Federoff, who's CEO of a bio research company. Uh, Mark, do a better job explaining who Dr. Howard is. Dr. Howard Federoff is probably the most knowledgeable man on the planet about the ins and outs of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. He actually moved from UC Irvine in Irvine, California. I actually moved him to UC Irvine, California to take a new post. And my client, Diane, said, take care of this guy. He says, I'll take good care of him, Diane. So can you move laboratories, she said. She said, I can move laboratories. She said, no, can you move laboratories? I said, Diane, I can move laboratories. You gotta trust me on this. Okay, because if you mess this up, Mark, I'm gonna lose my job. And so I didn't want that to happen. So I pulled out all the stops. I called Howard right away. I said, Howard, what's your biggest concern about this relocation? It's a question I would ask all my senior executives. I would move back in my career. He said, I'm glad you asked that. He says, I have 14 cryogenic freezers with 40,000 brain samples of people who have passed away with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Now, I was sitting there realizing, hey, I'm one of those guys, and wondering what the odds were that he and I would match up. Because when I said to him, Howard, uh, what do you, give me a little more about your concerns. He said, well, Mark, uh, if the temperature in that tra trailer goes up or down by more than three degrees, it will compromise my samples. And that's my life's work. I cannot afford for that to happen. You have to promise me that will not happen. Well, I know our industry is fraught with human error and issues and problems. It's not easy to control uh, a, a whole laboratory going from the East Coast to the West Coast, 3,000 miles, to make sure everything goes well. But I was very happy to say that when it, it did take place and we did do a wonderful job, there were no, no hitches, no complaints, nothing missing. It went without a flaw. And I can tell you that, that that was not a coincidence. That was a miracle. And after Howard's move, I moved another, no less than 100 of these similar scientists with similar precious cargo, every one went without a hitch. So I know there's a work above ourselves that's involved in some of these amazing feats that happen that we want to say, what a coincidence. No, I think it, was, it goes a little bit beyond that sometimes. So Howard uh, knows that I'm kind of out here in the desert now. This is where I retired to, a place called St. George. And I think he wants to keep me engaged with our, our work we've done in the past. So he called me up, and this is news to you guys. This is not for public knowledge yet, but it will be very soon. He's starting up a public, what's it called? PAB, Patient Advisory Board. And he's, he's choosing a chairman of the board. Believe it or not, he's going to uh, assign me as the chairman of the board for that committee. We've already got five people on the committee. We will be there to field calls from people that call us up, have that deer in the headlight look and say, oh my gosh, my doctor said I have Parkinson's. Oh my, I've got, I just found out I've got Alzheimer's. Just these people that don't know what to do. 
don't know where to turn to. It's so complex for them, they can't get their arms around it. And we'll be there to walk them down, help them get to a safe place, comfortable place, and give them whatever resources we can give them to help them during that transition. Now, you don't get that kind of service when you go to the, doc to the doctor. They're wonderful what they do, and they might diagnose your one problem, but you might have two or three other problems with symptoms or manifesting that they miss completely. And we think about that. So, so <laughs> go ahead, man. Let me just also quickly say that on the program September 5, this is going to be a live broadcast and, of course, recorded, it will be Dr. Federoff and Howard, and also uh, a lady by the name of Jana Stoudemire, who's uh, based in San Diego um, in a research lab. And she is uh, an executive with Axiom, which is a space launch corporation based at the Space Center in Houston. And they are building currently right now, building the new space station, which will be a commercial venture. And she's, uh, I think, senior VP or something like that. Um, and uh, she has been on the program before with Mark uh, and uh, Dr. Fedorov and also Dr. Paula Grisanti, who's the CEO of the National Stem Cell Foundation. We don't have Dr. Pauly yet, but Jana is going to be on the program and she's going to be giving us an update about the new U.S. space station that her company is building right now. And why is this important? Well, it's going to house medical research in zero gravity. Mark, why don't you take over Tell people what that means for neural research. Boy, you're asking the wrong person, Ed. I wish I could tell you I knew the ins and outs. Well, I, I, I read the words, but you have the feeling behind it. So I, I know in general that it, you can do much purer, much uh, more statistically accurate testing in a zero gravity atmosphere versus on, on, on the Earth here, because you've got gravity, there's all these things, so, so whatever test you're doing but so it's going to be i believe it's going to be a, a much purer way and a much quicker way to find out what these illnesses are and how we can correct them or maybe even prevent them a lot of the work that the scientific community does is tries to find ways to prevent the disease from coming on you know that and because to date there's no pill you can take for parkinson's you can't just take a pill you don't know where it comes from, what starts it. There's no cure, there's no remission. It just keeps on marching forward. And today, there's no one medication that has proven to be a cure for Parkinson's. And I, I don't think that's going to be anytime soon. So Mark, Mark, I, Mark I, uh, I just can't help myself. 60 minutes last Sunday, 7 o'clock, a Dr. Ali, R-E-Z-A-I, if you haven't seen it, it just seemed to have your name written on it. Dr. <laughs> Ali Rezai and the focused use of ultrasound and showing an actual patient receiving this focused ultrasound and his Parkinson shakes going away. And so the amazing success with Parkinson's, with Alzheimer's, and even talked about addiction I just wanted to make you aware of that if you were not, because it, I've lost a cousin of mine way back in high school to this dreaded disease. And I have a wife now with dementia. And so all families seem to be touched by this in some way or another. That 60 minutes segment was so powerful. And I strongly encourage you to check that out and see if there isn't uh, Mark Colo's name on uh, on that being somebody to get this fixed for you. It's it's a pleasure to see you again, sir. Gary, thank you, thank you for bringing that up. Joanne and oh, I yeah. watched that uh, show, uh, and it ties right into what's going on in the space station. What will go on in the space station? 
So in my research reading about what we're going to be talking about, so I can media prep myself and not sound like a dummy, is that what happens in the brain, uh, particularly in the brain, it happens in the body too, uh, that the body is set up with the immune, immune system to naturally fight off whatever is foreign. But sometimes it doesn't understand what to do and creates a problem within itself you know, within the body. And in apparently at zero gravity, that can be controlled better. And that's the key to um, doing the medical research uh, up in space and yeah, not, not here. And uh, apparently it's not been done yet, or maybe it has been tested. I, I don't know. What do you think, Mark? I don't know if it's assessed or not yet, but, but I know for me, myself, personally, my focus here on out is going to be people's quality of life and how are these illnesses impacting those qualities of life. I'm a big advocate of an adaptation proliferates possibilities. That's the, that's the title of my TEDx talk, if you do watch it. And it's just, it's very simple when you think about it. If you can adapt to your situation or the news or whatever it is, and adapt um, effectively. And I put, I share in my talk, I share five adaptive principles that will help a person get through almost any trial or challenge or, or moment of depression than, than anyone. When you think about uh, the, 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 uh, the word depression, if you scramble it up and turn it into three words, it's I pressed on. Well, wow. think about that. Uh, I traveled, I pressed on. And sometimes that's all you can do when you get some of this news. You know? But regardless of what you do, don't lose your sense of humor. You have to maintain a good, healthy sense of humor. Would you like to hear some of my Parkinson's jokes in, in closing? Will that be all right? Yeah, sure. Make us laugh. Hey, yes. fa- we have to laugh. We haven't laughed enough today. <laughs> I'm thankful I never have to purchase an electric toothbrush. <laughs> or, or play the drums. Right? Or play the drums. <laughs> Parkinsonians <laughs> make the best martinis. Shaken. Yeah. So, like good, so what about dancing, doing the jitterbug? Well, I haven't done that. I haven't learned that. <laughs> I got a good Michael J one though. I always have to pick on Michael J, right? It's okay to do that because I, I have Parkinson's. If Michael J. Fox were caught in a 9.0 magnitude earthquake, would he stand perfectly still? <laughs> Gotta think about that one, right? And then my last one is, and this is legit and this is true, and the other ones are fun, but I never once in a million years, having gone into the moving and storage industry for a career, I never once imagined I would be called a mover and a shaker. <laughs> and with that, let's go to Mr. Sirius with a great smile. <laughs> Hello, Christian. Welcome. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, that that was uh, amazing. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> I don't know whether I should laugh or cry, but I I laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. So uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking with him, with 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 Christian about uh, a couple of show ideas, and uh, one of them was uh, Gen Z. I said, uh, you know, we really ought to talk about Gen Z, and I don't know what to do about it really. Uh, and so he said to me. Uh, my daughter is Gen Z. Why don't we have her on the program or something like that? And I said, yes, right away. And we did a program uh, and it was a great program. Christian, why don't you explain what what it's like to have two in the house? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, Ed said we should have a voice of Gen Z. And I said, I happen to have two of them in my house handy. 
And uh, my older daughter, Natalie, was uh, on this show, and it was very gracious to, to have her on. And uh, Ken Lloyd was extremely supportive, and uh, she's still talking about it. And it, it was a great, great experience. And yes, I have a, a younger daughter, too. Who's, so Natalie, my older one, is 19. My younger one, Angelica, is 15. And uh, they're both uh, very interesting people. Indeed. And the conversation was really good and and truthful. And uh, I, I learned a lot. And the Thank audience you. that we've shown the program to the past uh, couple of weeks, uh, I'm, I'm getting uh, rave reviews from okay. around the, from around the world. Uh, so uh, if anybody wants it, oh, well, I'll send it anyway. You don't have to want it. <laughs> so I thank you for being on this program. Um, so Joseph McGuire, um, what, how's your family? Uh, are they getting better? Uh, no, there won't be any getting better, unfortunately. And uh, Mark's talk there um, really resonated because my younger sister, Rita, um, she has Down syndrome, but over the last year and a half, she's had rapidly progressed Alzheimer's Um and she's had frequent uh, chest infections, which bring her, unfortunately, a lot closer to the end. Um, so, and my mother's also deteriorating. So it's it's just how it is. It's all part of the uh, the life cycle, and sometimes it's more painful than other times. Um, so, yeah. Is there a secret um, to uh, dealing with it successfully? You, um, you know. For yourself, and you, you, you have deep business experience in dealing with problem people and and opportunity people, also. But uh, now yourself has has this difficulty and this challenge. And how do you mind me asking? Uh, and shoot well, me down if you do mind. But well, you know, how slightest, are you dealing? Yeah. How do, can you communicate to us and to the audience out there? How do you how do you sleep at night? How do you do this? Do you keep praying for guidance? You well, certainly. I think it's everybody's experience will be personal, and um, Gary will Gary will have his own personal experience there. So I, I absolutely empathise with 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 Gary's situation. Um, and there there are no two cases of Alzheimer's or dementia or Parkinson's that are exactly the same. And then there's all sorts of family dynamics you have to take into account. But dealing with problem people in a, in a business situation is a completely different experience because you are going in there detached. You're, you're there to do, a, to do a job, no matter what way you look at it. It can impact emotionally, but it's not going to be the same as family. And there are days that are straightforward. Um, you feel great. You, you get a smile from them and everything is very peaceful and then there are other days where it just takes a moment and it just hits you hard um uh and like with my sister she doesn't recognize us. well if she does recognize us anymore it's not apparent yeah. um she may speak very occasionally but if that's unpredictable um so yeah you just you just deal with it. Um, you can't, as a human, you can't fully prepare yourself. You just show up. Yeah. And you look to make sure that you have support as well, because that is essential. Um, and, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> that's really all I can say. You said a lot, Joseph, and I enjoyed your comments. It means a lot to me. And uh, I thought of one, one instance where, you know, as I was transitioning, as the oncoming of the disease was coming on and symptoms started to present themselves. I had dinner once with one of my bosses who had hired me fairly recently. He made a comment to me. He said, leaned over the tip and says, you look really stern right now. Did something bad happen? And it put the fear in me because I thought, what if he finds out I've got Parkinson's now, you know, is he going to let me go? Can I find an excuse to replace me? You know, you get these thoughts, though, that come into your mind. 
And I know sure there's certain legalities and certain you know laws you have to follow before you terminate an employee. You can't just check them off the list. But that was a scary place to be. And I, 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 I there's got to be so many others that are out there who have these diseases they're dealing with that are going to progress. They're degenerative, so they're going to progress and keep going. And that's got to be tough for these people. Uh, so something to think about with that. So anyway, I could talk for forever. I, I love talking. If any of you have any friends or anyone that you know that has comes down with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or whatever it is, you have them call me. And I would love to talk with them. I'd love to give them some coaching. I'd love to help them any way I can. So I hope you'll keep that offer from me. Right? Mark, thank you very much. And uh, if you can, um, send me uh, your phone number and I'll blast it out to the world. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but uh, um, I... I want to stop talking and let you guys talk more. Um, the, as you can tell, there's a lot of ways to communicate and everybody can win a communicator award if they communicate in a helpful way to someone who may be reaching out for help and they don't say those words, but you see that there's something going on. Paul Falcone, uh, you're dealing with difficult situations. You've written books about different, uh, I mean, difficult conversations, blah, blah, blah. And so what tips do you have? And uh, as we come to a close in the next few minutes here, summarize, how do you have difficult conversations? Well, the, Ed, the, and this has been such a great, great meeting and just listening to everyone and you, all of us sit back and all and you always think wow you have to come from gratitude for everything that you have in your life no matter where you find yourself at what station in your life come from gratitude it changes your perspective on everything i look around and i think you know gary singer and i have known each other for probably three decades he was my mentor growing up um a couple of months ago um tatiana saint germain drove down from wisconsin i was in chicago and we got a chance to meet. Uh, Christian and Ken and I are planning on meeting in Los Angeles in the, in the not too distant future. And we look around and it's like, it's this ability to sit around the campfire and share wisdom. We've gotten too busy for that, for some reason, right? And when we look at Gen Z, the 25 and under crowd, they keep testing out as the loneliest, the most isolated, the most oppressed generational cohort on the planet, even more so than people in retirement homes. This is a solution. The truth of the matter is, yes, it would be great to be able to do these things in person. That would be better. But there's so much that the technology allows us to do. It can move some of us to tears in a meeting just like this. It helps us with empathy. It helps us with understanding other people's plights. It helps us become non-judgmental. That's the wisdom that in the workplace works so well, but it obviously works very well in our personal lives. So I sit here humbled, humbled by the rest of you and Ed, the fact that you can bring together people from all over the globe, who in my case have now become personal friends. Um, what can I say? I'm humbled, I'm thankful, but this is the solution. It's more of us coming together. It's more of us passing wisdom, paying it forward and having one another's backs. It's being there for each other, especially in our times of need. It could be done electronically. It certainly should be done in person. But bravo to you, Ed, for bringing us all together to do this. You've set the model for everybody. Thank you. Chris? Well, I just, Ed, I, I, I just want to say uh, thank you for, again, pulling together this, this panel. Um, what, what makes it important is the diversity of, of the backgrounds and the perspectives. Um, everybody benefits. And, um, you know, I just... You know, it's fun to be with old friends like Gary and new friends like Christian, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's and, and Annalisa. I, I just I think one of the things you know, to, to, to Paul's point, I'm asked this a lot, you know, probably because I'm usually the oldest person in the room. You know, we don't seem to have community anymore. I mean, when we were growing up as kids in the United States, 
you know, our family was a community, our our cul-de-sac was a community, our schools, our sports teams. We were forced to be engaged in a community and we had to figure out how to fit in. And if we didn't fit in with one community and we had like, you know, of course I was never in the stamp club because I'm far too cool to be in stamp or debate club. Uh, but if, you know, and I, I, I but I was, and I declined to be captain of the football team because I, I wanted to, you know, associate more with the debaters, but you know what I'm getting at. We had to be in, 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 and now you see people confined to their own self-defined communities within a smartphone. And, and how do we associate? I mean, how do you, you know, like, like I had to play tackle football as, and my parents signed a waiver to ensure the city of Lake Forest that if I got hurt, they wouldn't sue them. And I, I mean, as a kid, I was aghast that my parents were sending me into the Coliseum. Um, but you, you learn to adapt. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how do people adapt these days? And, 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 you know, to your point, Ed, you, you've brought these people together. We've now more than ever, we've got to figure out how to build a global connected community that supports each other and doesn't divide people apart. I mean, Ed, you know this, I, I've lived outside the United States for almost 30 years now, and I go back, you know, I, I don't think I could work in the United States. I, I, I would need a repatriation course. And I, I don't even know. I mean, I don't, Gary could probably tell you, there's no one that's even going to hire me in the U S um, you know, I, and so the, the divisiveness and, and the, not a mentality of entitlement, but just this seeking news from sources that, you know, really give you what you, you already want to hear. I, what I love about this group is that this is, this is a group of people, and this is what you've done your whole career at, is bring a diverse group of people that are supportive and collaborative. Um, and, you know, that's a, you know, that's, that's why I'm, I'm so blessed to, to, to meet Heather and, and see Stephen and, and Paul and Ken again and Christian again. Tatiana, I think we've been on one call before and Mark, you know, uh, your story is inspiring and and Joseph, I can't say too much to you because you're going to be sending my coordinates to the to the the, the metaverse there. But you know, Ed, <laughs> th thank you so much. And I'll tell you something else. One of the things that it, I, I one of the reasons that I moved from Hong Kong to uh, Ukraine, and and most people, Ed, you know this. I, I don't have to work. I, I've reached that stage in my career where I could retire. But at this stage, I wanted my actions to be my statement. I wanted to come here, and by the fact that I'm just here speaks more than a lot of the investments or the, the donations or the charities or the business expansion. The fact that I'm I'm here, and I can leave any time, but I, and I also I choose to come back. You know, if you have a chance to make a difference, that's a chance I have to take. And the most rewarding period of my entire career has been the last 22 months here. It has been challenging, of course, and I can talk on another programmer in London why uh, you know why I don't speak Ukrainian. In fact, my alma mater uh, actually had a luncheon for me uh, a few months ago, and it was kind of a topic of conversation why I refuse to speak Ukrainian. Um, but it, it's we have a chance to really engage with people that we've never even thought that we could. And if that's how I go out in my career, well, then fantastic, you know, and I think that, you know, from from what Stephen and, and Paul and Ken and everybody else talks about, especially Heather, you know, it's 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 not about changing the problem employee. It's about finding how you can align motivations for a a company culture and with what people want to do. You know, I mean, our our corporate culture, I mean, Ed, you've known me for 25 years. No one's ever said I've been a nice guy. You know, I, I'm not, but you know, to, to, to be able to do this type of giving and philanthropic effort, you know, to actually be hugged by people, like, God damn, I, I, I wouldn't want to be hugged by anybody ever, you know, and, uh, but you know, to, to, to have that sense of commitment and community is something I've never experienced before. And, and here's a community that, that, you know, with those of us in this program and, and Ed, I just wish you continued success. Please continue to do this. I know it's not easy. It's always a challenge, but, you know, I think all of us are, are committed to seeing what we can do to help you promote this. So I thank you very much. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to have you all here. And, um, you know, this wasn't planned. Uh, the, the, uh, Global Communicator of the Year Award started uh, in about in 1999, 
and Philip Berry, who was on the show the other day, he was a re at the time he was a global VP of uh, Colgate Palmolive, managing people in sixty countries from a perch in Paris, <laughs> and that's where I met him. I was putting on a live meeting in Paris in '99 at uh, Le Meridien, and uh, the uh, expat. Uh, wife uh who was my local manager uh very plugged in to the expat wives community it sounds like a tv show Stephen. um expat wives of paris can you imagine the wives of beverly hills or something but that's a great idea we got to talk about that later <laughs> So anyway, she says, um, I'll help you get executives to show up at your Paris meeting, um, but don't embarrass me because all my friends are going to come. So, okay, I promise I won't. So anyway, she made an introduction to several um, expat who were husbands uh, that the wives were in the dual career situation and couldn't work <laughs> at the time. Um, but th these expat wives were all married to senior execs who were based in Paris, all right? And many of them came to this conference in Paris in November of 1999. So we partied like it was 1999, frankly. And uh, Philip Berry at the time was a big guy. Uh, in the world, uh, based in Paris, with giant corporation, Colgate Palmolive. He was our keynoter, and he talked about uh, managing people across borders, across cultures, and and this was in 1999, folks. It's, it's not a new topic. He was my first winner of the Communicator of the Year Award uh, because he launched me my, my first meeting in Europe was in London in 97 at the Hilton near the Marble Arch, just so you know. And uh, more than 200 people came. And it, that, that's a whole story in, at another time. But the idea of giving me giving an award, who am I to give an award? <laughs> well, I just had a magazine, okay, called Global HR News. And guess what? There, there it is right there, okay? And... Uh, that was a glossy, colorful magazine that was premiered at a national Sherm conference where I had a booth with 20,000 people uh, walking by the booth with that name, Global HR News. And everybody picked up a copy or bought one for Future Send. So it was like, whoa. So, and here we are, Global HR News is still around in this new iteration, not in print, this is it. And giving out awards of people who have a story to tell. And as you could tell, there's a lot of stories. And we're gonna continue this going forward. There are other people who couldn't make the show today who will appear in upcoming broadcasts and you're all welcome to join. Uh, and be back. I'm going to do this uh, frequently, but not in a big way. We're going to narrow focus into like a 30 minute, 15 minute uh, executive interview one on one. And then we'll have a small group environment as well. Um, large groups on, on Zoom don't work well. Uh, this has worked well because of you, <laughs> not because of me. And thank you for sharing. The audience out there in the world for the recorded edition that I'll circulate uh, through our network, uh, which is primarily YouTube, my YouTube channel, uh, now houses uh, 800 and th th this will be 860 of the productions that I've produced since uh, starting in March of 2020. Thank you. And mostly funded out of my pocket. And uh, the, the pocket is is getting holes in it so you know now that we have an audience and an established vehicle we're not going to put up a toll gate but uh, we're going to 
heavily seek advertisers and members of Global Press Club is what I'm calling it. But um, I love doing this. It's not work. I mean, it's work, you know, get up at four o'clock in the morning to prepare for this and make sure I get all my notes together and get everybody lined up. Um, I'm, I'm more productive, not lying in bed thinking about it, but getting up and sitting there and, and, and preparing so that I don't blow it because you're all watching me. And so uh, thank you for uh, doing that, really. And it's this, a real humble pleasure to be here. You're kind. And as we each talk about stuff that's important, then we get refocused into stuff that's really important. And when you get issues with family, with health, with neighborhoods, with communities, with wars, with disease, with loss, you know, I just feel really humbled to be here. And, you know, regardless of what area code we have our phone in, which country we're in, it's just really a pleasure to have this kind of a new group of friends that becomes deeper and more meaningful each and every time. And I think where each of us get to feel better is how can we help somebody else? How can we be supportive to someone else? So it's uh, Absolutely a pleasure to be here. Uh, you're to blame for putting us together. Thank you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And I found uh, a slide that I think perfectly encapsulates everything that we talked about today. Would you mind if I just pop it up for a second? Yeah, screen share is open for anyone else who wants to do this too. So we were talking about communication. I hope you can see that now. Yeah, it starts with you. Mindset and how you talk. My, my husband once said, we're all ships in our own bottles. So how do you get our stories and messages out? It starts with you. You uncork the bottle and get the message out. And then you create the environment where you help others uncork their bottles. And that hopefully will help us all solve that epidemic of loneliness and improve communication. Thank right. you. Thank you, Tatiana. Does anybody else have a slide they want to show up? Uh, don't forget, it will be part of the recorded program. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a slide. I can't see what it says. This is a live slide. Oh. Uh, so the, 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 the finest uh, water that uh, oh. they produce. Uh, so it's a, it's a live slide to to you, Ed, and to everyone else. Uh, oh, thank you. Bottoms up. Thank you. Thank bottoms you. up. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Have a wonderful okay. time. Cheers. Awesome bye to bye. be here. Take thank care. You. Hi, everybody. Okay. You'll, 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 you'll all get a copy of this later in my day today. Beautiful. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye, Thank you. Thank you.